Okay, students, so I'm walking in downtown Portland, and this is a lecture about deformants. We were reading Mark Sample's ideas about the deformed humanities, and I thought what I would do, by be I would begin by um, deforming the lecture, by taking it out of the podium, away from the sacrosanct space of the classroom, and taking it into the city where the humanities is all around us. So. I think I'm going to begin also by suggesting that there are ways for you to go about reading this piece. What do you do when a work of art is hard or a piece of criticism is hard? How do you find a point of entry? That is where we'll begin. So when we're talking about deformance, we're talking about two things, deforming and performance. The deforming part, as you'll see in the comments, the 36 comments posted on Mark Sample's piece, the, the metaphor of deforming is in fact problematic. It conjures um, invidious comparisons to people who are uh, not fitting into the mainstream, uh, deformity as grotesque, uh, but that's not really my interest in this. I'm more interested in the way that deformance um, takes the performative element of the humanities and brings it to life. It makes it new by giving us a critical distance from which to see stuff. So that's what I'm going to ask you to do, actually, is I'm going to ask you to begin your reading or to, I don't know, give yourself some critical mastery by starting with the comments. The comments are going to read backward in the same way that reading a poem backward is a deformance. I'd like you to look, look at the comments and think about how they respond to Mark Sample's claims and reframe them. I'll also suggest that this is a crucial element of the digital humanities. In this, our class, which is an introduction to digital humanities, we're thinking a little bit about the ambient quality of the humanities, about how um, it's a conversation. I want to recall to your mind the Stephen Ramsey claim from the, the, hermeneutic, uh, the Scriminatical Imperative, um, in which He's talking about the millions of individualized paths through the canon that is the humanities. And really what in here is are those moments of um, collaboration, those moments of comment, those little brief meetings of ideas that actually build knowledge and become the basis of research. So then I guess I'll begin my comments by starting with Lisa Rohde's observation that uh, much as me, we may wish to keep uh, the deformance a broken Humpty Dumpty with the egg yolk dripping out, as Mark Sample uh, tellingly conjures, in fact, our brains wish too much to seek order. They wish too much to put things back together. And I think that that is, in fact, the great strength of the deformed humanities or deformance, which is uh, that the broken thing and the imaginatively repaired thing are signifying at the same time. That in fact it's um, what Bakhtin would call polyvocality. So that rather than the humanities being definitive, this is what a poem means, this is what the artist's intention was, instead it's a set of associations, it's a more fluid uh, set of operations. Now theorists like Foucault um, would make sense of such um, power relations by suggesting that they reveal systemic uh, operations that we can generalize about. But I find such readings to be, um, to be useful to explain at some level how uh, things operate. Sorry, a little distracted. I'm getting all these messages flashing on my screen as I talk to you, talk about deformed humanities. Um, that, that the discursive power operations are in fact true, but they can't perpetually be true. In other words, they can't fully explain or contain um, the vitality or the, the truancy of the humanities. And I suppose that's why I like Lisa Rohde's reading of Mark Sample's piece, is that it suggests um, the ways in which our brains will naturally seek to make order out of the chaos of a deformance. So let me get to a couple definitions. Like, What is a deformance? It is um, Often, at least, it's, it's using, I'm thinking about Stephen Ramsey's art, uh, argument in reading machines, um, it's the using the machine reading capabilities to defamiliarize texts. If you think about it, stories are told with a specific order, beginning, middle, and an end, and books were optimized to present that order so that you could hack a book by picking it up and reading from the middle, or you could read it upside down, or you could cut it into pieces. You could do all kinds of things, but the procedural quality of the book was 
is to have you start in the beginning with almost no weight in your left hand and to proceed through the book and keep reading until it was entirely weighted. Uh, but a machine reading of uh, literary texts would actually permit you to do all kinds of searches that would reveal perhaps surprising relationships, like how often do these two characters show up in proximity to each other? Uh, that would be one thing. Or uh, how many times um, does George Eliot use uh, nouns in the epigraphs to Middlemarch? You know, you could do all kinds of machine reading capabilities that human reading skills would be extraordinarily onerous to process. So that's one way to think about what the deformed humanities can offer. So at this moment I want to think about the utility of the deformed humanities or deformance to you. I also do want to open up space for us to invent new metaphors for thinking about this quality of brokenness because of course you guys are making your own adaptations and as we know adaptation is repetition with the difference. In fact it involves a bit of deformance, it involves a bit of unmaking in order to create a new vision of something new. Um, I think one thing we have to let go of and that, that deformance helps us to get a critical purchase on is the notion that we'll have an integrated whole, we'll have a sense of the whole thing uh, as, as it exists transhistorically. That just, we, for a long time we've known that, I mean Bart uh, was the first to disrupt the idea of the author as uh, a, a authorial intention or a set of functions that uh, would, would perform a certain way. Um, in fact, he noted that the act of reading is also really the act of writing, that the reader makes meaning really uh, actively. Uh, he was writing this um, in Pleasures of the Text and in Essed in the mid-1960s. So the kinds of disruption, I, I would argue, that were born, that were activated in the world around, like this world, the sorts of disruptions that were happening in the world around BART. I'm thinking of May 68 in Paris and of course in the United States and civil rights. Those things told themselves in the ways that we approach literature. So too at this critical moment, I would say, uh, we have a dispersed humanities, a humanities that is alive on the Twitter stream, that's broken up into lectures um, that we post onto YouTube. Um, it's a way of being that takes learning out of the classroom and into public space. So a humanities that's all around us, that lives in our mobile devices, that, we, that um, enables us to recombine in surprising ways, that seems to me an incredibly potentially political, political humanities, one in which uh, the voices of ordinary people are getting intermixed and remixed with um, what we would think of as the canon. So as you think about your adaptations, I want you to think quite specifically about what they mean to you. Now this kind of intensely personalized humanities um, might be derided as too subjective, but I'm thinking a bit about Jack Halberstam's uh, argument in Profession from 2012 that um, a good lecture is one that meanders, that the humanities is not meant to convey a set of bullet points or uh, a set of procedures really, but that those procedures that we do engage in the humanities are meant actually to prompt further reflection. Uh, the scholarship that I saw uh, Adeline Coe and Natalia Cesar and others uh, invoking uh, at the Modern Languages Association convention in Chicago two weekends ago, I think that kind of, to acknowledge that even if it's not definitive, there is an accumulated body of work that circumscribes knowledge and that the deformed humanities allows us to participate in and disseminate. Um, so I guess that's the point of connection uh, is between what Mark Sample is arguing for, that broken quality, and uh, what I'm observing as I sit here in the Pearl District of Portland with the light bouncing off of 19th century buildings. Um, what I'm thinking about is the ways in which our somatic responses to the devices that we use to access these networks um, are in fact a, a new portal into the humanities and that for us in this class that introduces you to the digital humanities and to new media, um, I'm thinking a bit about those points of connection, the sutures if you will, that pull together the medial and the, uh, the literary. 
Ian Bogos does something interesting in Alien Phenomenology when he imagines, he depicts the work of, of building as a kind of carpentry. Um, Mark Sample talks about this moment when Bogos um, rebuilds uh, the Atari display from the point of view of the Atari system, right? That kind of defamiliarization. Um, I would align this practice of Bogost's with um, what's being called critical making. Uh, Dini Grigar uh, and Roger Whitson just uh, collected a bunch of uh, digital humanities projects that are acts of scholarship in which making is a foundational element of the practice. Uh, that we learn through making. It's a fine arts premise, Dini Grigar notes, uh, that when activated in humanities contexts can actually take us a long way. Um, this, uh, Mark Semple puts this idea into practice when he's thinking, uh, when he takes uh, this book, this crowdsourced book called Hacking the Academy, and he takes the whole, uh, all of the words in it, and he replaces every noun with a different noun that is seven entries in the dictionary further on than the original source word. That's called an n plus seven um, algorithm. Uh, and that idea was invented by the Ulipo, the um, computational poets and mathematical poets um, of mid 20th century France. And they're still around today, the Ulipo. So what, uh, you know, Sample wants to think of this, uh, this act of making, uh, in which he has all these very beautiful puns in the last paragraph of the essay, so I refer you to look at it. Uh, he, he imagines this as, as somehow antipodal to yakking. There's hacking and there's yakking. There's making and there's just talking about making. And, you know, uh, I don't want to simplify Mark's argument because I actually think, um, uh, un unlike Brian Croxell in the first comment uh, to the piece, I don't think this is just an extension of Mark's uh, persona. I think this is actually a very interesting um, piece of scholarship that could stand without one's knowledge of at sample reality uh, on Twitter. Um, but I suppose that if we're imagining the carpentry as somehow more formal and objective than the cult of personality that Brian Croxell is, is talking about in his comment to uh, the Deformed Humanities piece that Mark Sample did, then we see these two different imaginations of what the humanities look like in the digital age. That is to say that they're seeking after a sort of formal purity uh, that is computationally possible, uh, that was never really, that is still a fantasy, it's still not something that will ever be actually attained, but that uh, the allure of uh, the kind of digital forensic perspective uh, continues to animate those who are hunting for the kind of truth value that um, an algorithm can deliver. Uh, but I think as, as, as all of the, to my mind, best thinkers in the field will attest, those sorts of material realities uh, are really just jumping off points for interpretation. That data don't tell stories by themselves. They only indicate, they just give us new information uh, from which to, to make interpretations about what's at work in the humanities. Um, as you think about your own reading practice, your own making practice, um, I want you to have a wider data set than we normally permit. Um, you know, Mark Semple talks a bit about writing this thing that we desperately, that obsesses us and that we desperately hunt after, and that is the core activity of the humanities is still ultimately just yak. Um, well, I don't know, Bart would have us think uh, that writing is also being, is also thinking, is also walking around the city and situating ourselves in moments where um, the principles that we study can animate themselves and surprise us. So I want you to expand your data set as you think a little bit about critical making in the humanities.